So good afternoon to, to everyone, to all the panelists who's agreed to speak and also to all the participants. Good afternoon to those in Seychelles and greetings to those joining us from, from other time zones. From the attendees, I can see there are some that are not based here. So welcome to the very final session of uh, what has been our week-long Seychelles Ocean Science Symposium. My name is Marime Muzungaile, and I've been given the, the great task of being your chair for this afternoon session. So uh, just some quick housekeeping before we get started. So we have a lineup of five presentations today. Each of them will be between 10 and 15 minutes, and then this will be followed by, by a short question and answer. So be sure to, to take note that if the presenters say that they, they do not want their presentations or images of their presentations to be shared, so please do respect that. You will be given the chance to write all your questions in the question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen, and the speakers will endeavor to answer them during the four minutes it's been allocated to them. Any questions that outrun this time, they will still be able to answer in the chat, uh, um, in the chat tab at the bottom. So keep uh, keep on the lookout for your answers. And um, and if there are any other issues, you may want to to um, to type that in as well, so that it can come to my attention and the attention of the other speakers online. So with that, we're going to get started with the first presentation. All of our presentations today they have the overarching theme of conservation. And we're gonna start off with Dr. Amir Ibrahim. Um, Amir Ibrahim is a marine ecologist with a vast experience in fisheries management and ecology. He received his PhD in marine ecology earlier this year at the University of Queensland, Australia, where his research was focused on the ecological and functional roles of commercially important rabbit fish species in a marine environment. He's currently the principal fishery scientist at the Seychelles Fishing Authority, where he's doing uh, pre preliminary development, facilitating and coordination of scientific research programs in the Seychelles and forming strong interna international ties with the sector. He's also, outside of this um, responsibility, the chief scientific advisor to the James Michel Foundation, which aims to promote the blue economy concept to sensitize people about climate change and its impact on Seychelles and the world, to promote environmental protection and sustainable development, and to defend and promote the cause of small island developing states. Um, he's also currently a joint awardee of a large sacred grant that's looking to explore blue carbon opportunities in Seychelles. So Dr. Amir, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, so today I'll be presenting um, a chapter out of my PhD uh, research. Um, let me just get this screen going. All good? Okay, so the... Okay, so the, the, the talk today is called the Commercially Important Shoemaker Spine Futsigana Suto Connects Coral Reefs to Neighboring Seagrass Meadows. Uh, so just to give you guys a bit of an overview, um, as mentioned, it's a chapter taken out of my PhD research uh, that was done in Seychelles. I'll be talking to you about the significance of this research, the aims, the methodology and analysis, the results, discussion, and finally, um, giving you a brief conclusion. So talking about the significance. So I think we all know that coral reefs are under threat and uh, they facing these threats primarily from anthropogenic effects, which include um, destructive fishing practices, the runoff of sediments and nutrients, coastal development and uncontrolled tourism activities among others. However, they're also under threat from natural disasters such as the effects of El Ninos and some of the effects of El Ninos are high um, sea surface temperatures, which cause coral bleaching. Um, so it's been established that key functional groups of fish species promote coral reef resilience, and some of these key species are parrotfish, surgeonfish, and rabbitfish. Um, they either rapidly uh, browse, scrape, um, feed on detritus, um, or algal material on the reef, which helps promote resilience. 
So by understanding the spatial ecology of this fish is an important component that determines the function of marine ecosystems such as coral reefs. And uh, scientists tend to use acoustic telemetry to help track their movements in order to, to uh, learn about their spatial ecology. So um, species display high site fidelity and habitat utilization patterns can help researchers identify spawning sites, feeding sites, shelter areas, and effectively leads to um, effective management. And so when we determine how far a fish moves, it, it gives an indication of their home range. And um, just to give you guys a bit of an example of what's been done around the world, uh, two species of parrotfish, the red-tailed parrotfish and the surf parrotfish um, have been established that they have small home ranges between 200 to 300 meters. On the other hand, we have um, uh, two species of chub, the brassy chub and the brown chub, um, that have large home ranges that are over more, uh, more than one, two kilometers. Um, and so these two species are considered um, essential uh, um, parameters to determine home range. So um, coral reefs, it has been established now that coral reefs are do not function in isolation, but rather part of a larger habitat network. So some of these key species, such as parrotfish, um, surgeonfish, and rabbitfish, have been known to travel to seagrass meadows. And so uh, why they travel to the seagrass meadows? Seagrass may be providing important nursery habitats, feeding grounds, or shelter habitats. And by understanding these networks, it helps affect um, uh, marine protected areas in a, in a more beneficial manner. Um, looking more towards uh, the region of the Western Indian Ocean. So uh, rabbit fish make up the bulk of, of the artisanal fishery throughout the, 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 the Wyo region. Um, around uh, the eastern coast of Africa, they, they cons constitute more than 40% of the total artisanal catch. Uh, more locally in the Seychelles, they make up the bulk of the artisanal catch dominated by Sigana Suto, which is um, uh, the white spotted spine foot, or um, known as locally as Cordonia Blanc. Um, and they make up 60% of the total artisanal catch. Um, and the, there is control that has been established, uh, such as minimum mess size, but they, uh, they're, not, they're not enforced. So um, it allows juveniles to be captured. And also, it must be noted, the spatial ecology of the species remains fairly unknown. Uh, we don't know, are these rabbit fish staying on coral reefs? Are they traveling to seagrass meadows? Is there connectivity between coral and seagrass meadows? There's a big question mark. So the aim of the study was first to determine the home range of Sigana Suto. Do they travel uh, to coral reefs that, in, uh, that are close to them? Do they travel to coral reefs that are further away? Also, we wanted to determine whether they um, are mobile linked to neighboring seagrass meadows. Do they travel far to access seagrass meadows or close to access seagrass meadows? And also we wanted to determine whether there was connectivity between seagrass and coral. And finally, we wanted to compare the duration of the occupancy in the different habitats. Uh, so looking briefly at my methodology, um, the study was carried out on Dennis Island um, in Seychelles, which lies on the northern rim of the Mahe Plateau. It's a 1.4 kilometer coral cave, so it's very small. Um, and uh, just for now, just ignore uh, the little red dots. Um, this is just to show you, I just want you to focus on um, where the coral um, exists shown in pink and where the seagrass exists shown in uh, green. So during the study, we used um, acoustic receivers in total, 22 were placed around the island. So now looking at the red dots on the map, those were the exact locations of um, the acoustic receivers. So <clears throat> they were strategically placed. We wanted to cover only seagrass meadows, only coral habitats, and a mixed habitat of both coral and seagrass. And receivers were placed between 200 to 800 meters apart, and um, and and the detection ranges did not overlap. And uh, just a little bit of a note: the we carried out a range testing exercise, and each receiver had a range of 150 meters. So um, we had to capture fish, and we used uh, the traditional methods of um, uh, uh, the fish traps. But I also enlisted the help of uh, a local on the island, and he helped me 
um, by drifting by using a, a small drift net um, on a low tide. Um, so once the fish were captured, they were placed under anesthesia. Uh, fork length measurements were taken. Um, we double tagged them. So first we inserted a T-bar tag, um, and then we made an incision and inserted the, the, the acoustic tag. And uh, um, I played doctor and uh, stitched up using three non-overlapping stitches. And uh, the fish were then placed in an aerated tank for recovery before release. And uh, so this is a photo of me releasing them in, in, into the ocean. And uh, there were no fatalities um, at the time of release. We watched them all swim away. In total, 25 ind individuals ranging from 19 centimeters to 29 centimeters were tagged and released. And they are considered all adults, according to the literature. Looking uh, specifically now at the analysis, I'll try not to try to make it a bit complicated. I'll try and uh, uh, make it as brief as possible. Um, so the acoustic receivers were um, in the soak for approximately just over six months. Um, the data was an, um, offloaded and analyzed using the view software. Um, and the first 24 hours of detection data were excluded from the analysis. Any signs of mortality were detected and excluded. And uh, based on this, 10 individuals were excluded. So in total, we uh, used the data from 15 individuals in, in the analyses. Um, so we wanted to determine the home range. And the way the home range was determined was we um, used uh, the residency index. It is simply put the number of days when a fish was detected on any of the receivers within the array. And in our case, there were 22 receivers divided by the time interval between the first day of the experiment and the last day of the experiment, the fish was detected. So zero indicates zero residency and one indicates permanent residency. The, the, the detection data for each fish was divided into diurnal and nocturnal sampling periods. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll explain to you why exactly we did this. Um, and the home range length of each fish was determined using um, um, the MLD and the median distance travel, the MDT. So um, just a bit of a definition. The MLD is defined as the shortest possible distance between the two most distant receivers when individual had been detected. And the MDT provides a metric for the median dispersal of an individual from its principal area of residence. Um, the MDT of each fish was determined by firstly identifying the most popular receiver visited by that fish. And calculating the median distance between that receiver and all other receivers where that fish was detected. Um, so um, the reason why we separated diurnal and nocturnal periods was simply because the spatial extent of fishes can be primarily determined by observing environmental cues such as the dial cycle. And monitoring the use of different habitats during different times of the day can further explain important biological and ecological processes of fish species, such as foraging behavior, predator avoidance, resting areas, and in turn supports mobile link evidence. Um, so to determine the activity within each habitat, we use statistical modeling. So to discriminate between habitats, that is between coral, seagrass, and mixed habitats that attracted the greatest activity from s 2 we used um, GLMs in R, and the number of detections at each site were the response variable and the area of coral and seagrass within each detection zone of each receiver were the predictive variables. And uh, we determined the area coverage of each, of each area um, estimated within 150 meter radius because that was the range that the receiver would ping, uh, was identified using satellite imagery. And then we use a, a quasi Poisson distribution model to account for overlapping dispersed data. Um, and then uh, the GLM predict function was used in R to explore how changes in the cover of coral and seagrass affected the number of detections. Uh, looking at the home range, so, um, uh, sorry, looking at the results of, of the home range, individuals travel an overall distance of about 900 meters during the day and barely at night. And uh, they traveled the range range from about 300 meters to 2,400 meters during the day and zero to 150 meters at night. So the diurnal values were extensive and on average um, covered 15% of the total coastline of, 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 of the island. And a significant difference was found between the diurnal and nocturnal MLDs. So just looking briefly at the graph, um, you can see that most of the detections happen during the day compared to at night. 
Um, and Sigana Suto were most active between 6 and 8 a.m. So looking at the second graph, you can see 6 and 8 a.m. It's where we receive the most average number of detections. So the patterns of the MLD were reflected by that of the MDT. Every tag fish traveled great distances away from their primary detection zone. And on average, MDTs were between 300 and three, about 200 meters during diurnal periods and zero meters during nocturnal periods. So looking at the daily movement patterns, when we analyzed a single 24 hour period, and we did this um, by selecting five random days, just for comparison, we found that the MLD values were relatively small, um, less than 200 meters. And they occurred solely during the daytime. And on average, 20% of an individual's total diurnal MLD and 0% of an individual's total nocturnal MLD. The average daily MLD values of each individual was significantly higher during the day compared to at night. And looking at the activity within each habitat, um, so we found that one receiver, um, I don't know if you can see clearly, um, uh, station nine, which has, is on the bottom tip of the island, received 60% of all the detections. And again, looking back at this graph, you can see clearly that it received both um, the most daytime and nighttime uh, detections. And again, they were more, Suto was found to be mobile during the day, mostly during the day. And significant detections were found within each habitat. So by separating it into different habitats, that is coral separately, seagrass separately, and mixed habitats, it's, there's, a, there's a clear um, pattern that uh, it re received most receive, um, signals from mixed habitats. And statistically, we show that seagrass cover influenced the number of detections. And coral cover was marginally significant. As you can see, the p-value was 0 0.06. So it was worth mentioning. But definitely, seagrass influenced the number of detections. So looking at um, the activity within each habitat, in total of the study, we had 6,585 detections. And um, the opt so we de determined the optimal um, area that attracted the most detections had um, a coral cover be uh, between 50,000 and 60,000 meters squared. And the seagrass cover that was between 30,000 and 40,000 meters uh, meter squared. So approximately as a ratio, it's 1.6 to one. And using um, statistical modeling, this was uh, reinforced. So we basically found the, the, the same result when we, when we use statistical modeling. As you can see that uh, um, the ideal uh, area is between 50,000 60,000 meters squared. So going on to my discussion. So this was the first study to provide approximations for movement and home range size of the commercially important Sigana Suto. And it strengthens our knowledge of their role as mobile herbivores and, and tropical leaks on coral reefs. So basically, we know for sure that they are traveling between coral and seagrass habitats on a daily basis. So um, one of the, the, the second points um, up for discussion was Sigana Suta on average occupied a section of reef about 900 meters long. And this is two to eight times greater than, than other similar sized schooling herbivorous fish species, such as the two species of parrotfish that I brought up earlier before. So, um, so both these species um, displayed limited home ring sizes and are not considered mobile links on, on, on coral reefs. Conversely, um, the two species of sea chub um, in northwestern Australia have um, a home range of more than two kilometers. And so they are considered con uh, critical um, uh, um, uh, uh, they, they have a, a critical home range size. Um, so although Sigana Suto did not show such extreme movements as those two species of brown chub, but they still encompass an area that both covered both coral and seagrass habitats. And um, surprisingly, other studies have ruled out the importance of seagrass meadows to adult Sigana Suto. And they've only found that it, it, uh, it benefits uh, juveniles. However, obviously from this species, we only tagged adults and we showed that uh, it, it benefits both adults as well as juveniles. And so this is an important finding from a management perspective. It shows that seagrass appear to be crucial habitats for Sigana Suta at all different life stages. So um, 
most, uh, as mentioned before, most detections occurred within mixed habitats that had both coral and seagrass. And again, the optimal number of detections were within coral to seagrass ratio, um, 1.6 to 1. And this was confirmed again through statistical modeling. So we, we um, assume that the coral structure may be providing shelter from predation, while the seagrass may be a vital food source. So um, I confirmed that uh, Siga and Suto were in fact feeding on the seagrass um, on another um, chapter of my PhD, which has been published in uh, coral reefs. So looking when we looked again at the daily movement patterns, they um, they had quite small daily movement patterns of about 300 meters. So um, this assumes that they distributed as predicted by foraging models um, and individuals um, forage ma to maximize the energy gain by distributing their size proportionate to the resources. So overall in the study, they had a large um, home range, but looking at, at, at uh, the daily patterns, they had a small home range. So basically what it means is that um, uh, they would find areas that benefited um, them closer to where they were. So whether they had coral and seagrass, they would use a coral shelter and then feed on the seagrass. But once they used up those resources, then they would move uh, to another area. And that's why probably we received such a large home range from them. Yep, so I just mentioned that. Uh, so uh, grazing on seagrass has been known to promote um, uh, seagrass growth and productivity because they, they actually would target not the blades of the seagrass, but rather the epiphytes that grow on, on the seagrass blades. Um, again, we established that Cigana Suto was a diurnal herbivore. And it was confirmed uh, through one of my other chapters on my PhD. Um, and they showed that uh, the, basically the chapter showed that Tsigana Suto would at, uh, um, target nutrient resources of algal material, particularly during the morning. So also we discovered some nocturnal dete detections and they were mostly at station nine. Um, again, uh, the southern tip of Dennis Island or at the bottom where is um, station nine located. And it could be a possible resting site for, 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 for the species. Um, just uh, finally, a conclusion. Um, it's a study that provides supporting evidence that network habitats to coral reefs, such as seagrass meadows, should be considered when designing MT uh, MPAs. And the connectivity of habitats and the strength of the linkages to species within management components must be investigated in order to establish effective protection. And obviously we acknowledge so there were a few limitations of, of the project. First, the patterns exhibited by Sigana Suto were concentrated around a small isolated island, as mentioned, 1.4 meter uh, kilometer squared, where resources such as seagrass are in fairly close proximity. So it'd be very interesting to, to replicate the study in other areas where seagrasses may, may be uh, quite far away compared to, to coral reefs. And, um, the movement patterns may vary with location. So we, we don't know if on granitic reefs and compared to the carbonate reefs, if that might influence the number of detections as well. And also we, we only considered um, seagrass meadows. Obviously um, uh, there's a lot of research to back up that uh, mangrove habitats as well are, are critical habitats, critical network habitats. And so um, it's another area um, for, 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 for exploration in the future. And uh, thank you very much. That was the end. Um, so this this uh, talk that I gave today is published in uh, the Journal of, of Fish Biology, and whoever wants to access it can just download it via the DOI. Um, if you do have any issues downloading the paper, you can you can uh, just send me an email, and I'll be happy to share it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. Um, that was a very um, interesting presentation. I I enjoyed it. Um, uh, so let's see if we have some questions from the question and answer tab that we can relate to you. Okay, so we have one. Mm -hmm. How does this study compare to the Siganus tracking around Kuze and the work by Jude Bijou around Prale? Do okay, they show yes. similar movement patterns? <clears throat> Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Um, so yes, Jude Bijou's um, work on, on Prana, he was looking more at spawning aggregations. Um, so um, one, of, uh, the, one of the things that we did look at is were actually these movements uh, on Dennis Island due to, to spawning aggregations? And we, we, we ruled it out. Firstly, whenever we tagged a fish, 
we look for maturing gonads or we look for signs of, of, of maturing gonads and none of them display any signs of maturing gonads. But also looking at the movement patterns, there was no sporadic movement. So um, they, the, the, the movements were consistent throughout the study. So as mentioned to you, they would move from the coral to the seagrass and back again between the mixed habitats. So there was no sporadic movement of them all aggregating to one place that would might have predicted um, a spawning aggregation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I don't see any um, any further questions, but if there is anything else, then people can can send direct chat messages to the to you, and you will be able to answer.